So this is a presentation uh, mainly on how we're currently using the JDP framework and a bit on the JDP framework itself. Uh, I'm Richard Pelfop, I'm the creator of JDP and I work in the SUSE kernel and networking QA team. So first of all, an abstract description of what JDP is and I'll move on to something more concrete. So JDP in principle, is supposed to make creating arbitrary uh, and in particular unusual and exotic reports and workflows easy um, so that you can experiment wildly uh, with reports that maybe require data from many different data sources um, and take advantage of the successful experiments while not incurring too much cost of the unsuccessful experiments. And the way JDP aims to do this is by removing, by creating an infrastructure so that if you want to create a report that needs lots of data from many different data sources, you can just use a single interface to get that data and a single set of tools to analyze it um, while still giving you a lot of freedom in how you analyze it what algorithms you use, what data structures you use. And it puts all the data into one place and just generally removes a lot of the mess and the glue to one place so that you can quickly knock up some report or whatever and get on with things afterwards when it fails or you know, take advantage of the success of that report. Okay, so enough waffle, and I'll try and move on to showing you something concrete. Uh, presently, we mainly just use it for analyzing test results and bugs. Uh, after all, we are the kernel and QA team. So while JDP has very lofty goals, we're actually using it for something quite down to earth at the moment. So I will start by showing you one of our reports. So this is the result status difference report. So we have uh, tens of thousands of test cases. Uh, a lot of those test cases pass, which is nice. Um, however, some of them are failing or they are being skipped or they produce no result because there's some problem with the testing infrastructure. And because there's so many test results, we find it very difficult to keep track of those tests which are being skipped or have no result. Um, and it's quite easy for a test that has been passing for a long time or failing for a long time simply to then stop being executed for whatever reason, probably due to some issue with the test runners or the infrastructure. And we may only find out about that at uh, some random later date when some other problem pops up and somebody happens to look in that direction. So this report shows tests which have changed status recently. Okay, hopefully that explains what it's trying to do, but maybe as I show you it more, it'll become more obvious if I haven't explained that well. So this is a Jupyter document. Uh, if you haven't seen Jupyter documents before, they're basically a list of cells. Um, you have markdown cells, which are just displayed in Doubtline as markdown, and you have code cells. Um, and you can run the code cells one at a time, or you can run them in a linear set, uh, or you can run them out of sequence. You can do whatever you like, really. And each cell will... Uh, you know, the last command in the cell, uh, whatever the result of that is, uh, that will be displayed graphically uh, by Jupyter if there's a graphical display function for whatever object you've returned. So you'll now be able to see this in action, hopefully. Oh yes, if I run this cell, this cell just produces HTML. So it produces a, a structure which has a HTML type it basically just produces a string which is wrapped in a HTML type and Jupyter displays this graphically. 
um, now we have a cell which fetches a bunch of test results from our data cache. So we have a distributed data cache. Uh, I have a local node running which fetches data from our master cache and then my uh, report process fetches um, a chunk of test result structures, uh, structs or objects from my local cache into my RAM. So first of all, I'll just explain what OpenQA is in case you don't know. OpenQA is a, um, uh, a test runner. Well, it's an entire testing framework and it's something of a beast so it can do all kinds of things. In the kernel and networking team, we use it, we embed other test suites inside it. OpenQA itself also has native test suites which are written in OpenQA, but we basically have a, a Linux test project test runner, which runs the Linux test project within OpenQA and um, integrates quite well into OpenQA so that, okay, that's not a good example, so that you can view LTP test results within OpenQA. Yeah, so OpenQA starts a VM or a, sets up a bare metal machine and then proceeds to send commands to that system under test, which will uh, boot the machine and run some Linux test project tests. Okay. And um, this method here, repository fetch, will get a list of uh, test results from OpenQA in a vector. Um, within JDP, we have a concept, we have the concept of trackers. Uh, trackers are basically like add-ins for JDP. So the OpenQA tracker has a bunch of functions which will deal with the OpenQA API, will normalize data from OpenQA, so on and so forth. We also have a Bugzilla tracker, which does similar things to Bugzilla. Um, and because uh, we currently just fetch test results from OpenQA and we don't have any other test frameworks which we fetch results from, we, we use this uh, test result struct, which is specific to OpenQA. But in the future, when we add more test frameworks to JDP, we'll instead use a normalized test result object. So it won't be inside the OpenQA namespace. Okay. Also, it might be worth pointing out that we don't actually store um, OpenQA test result objects in our data cache. We actually store job results. So a job result um, actually just contains a list of modules and comments from OpenQA and logs and various other raw data from OpenQA. And uh, these modules, module structures and the OpenQA job result structures don't have a one-to-one -one mapping to the test cases in our um, test suites that we're using, like the Linux test project. Um, so we take these job results, we inspect their contents, like we inspect their modules. So if I, oops, look at this. Then, yeah, basically within each uh, job, we have a bunch of modules and the output of these modules and also the test steps or the form of these modules and these test steps will be different for each test suite that's with an open QA. And we have a bunch of normalization functions within JDP to basically bring all these things together and produce a, um, 
nice normalized structure like the test result, which has things like name, the suite, product, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so yeah, hopefully I've given you some idea there of uh, what's going on, maybe not. Okay, so now getting back to what we want to do in our report, we want to make a table, which we'll see in a minute. So first of all, we create a matrix. And um, within our matrix, we can further define what we consider to be a unique test suite, uh, which is defined here by the field subset ordering. Maybe not the best naming, but um, this defines how uh, well, what we consider to be a unique test case and also what we consider what order how we will order this test case so it will first order it by the test suite the name and the machine type which the test is running on and flags etc um, and each one of these uh, symbols here is a field in the test result so you can use any of these fields for the ordering assuming that uh, that the object, the type of that field can be used in an ordering. So we can do some extra processing in what we consider to be a unique uh, test result. And then we can truncate the builds. In fact, yes, well, we're not really truncating the builds. We'll take all 11 builds. Then we have some helper functions, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, OK, so down here we want to actually display the results as part of the table. So yes, this is the actual matrix. So along here we have the builds that we've extracted from our test results. Um, we can see that a lot of the builds have been filtered. This is because if we look, oh, we still have quite a lot of results there. But if, if we look in OpenQA, we can see a lot of the, a lot of the builds were very bad. I mean, in all cases, x86 is failing due to a test runner issue. Um, but basically it's ended up just filtering it to these three builds because in these two builds we've had even more infrastructure issues. So if we look up here, we can see this figure just here is the bad build tolerance, which is inserted somewhere around there. And it's passed to this function and what this base, this function basically does is it calls a more generic um, function within the OpenQA tracker library, and it counts the number of test cases with either a result that's missing because OpenQA hasn't returned any result for that build, or results where OpenQA has returned a result but the result is just none which basically means OpenQA wasn't able to run that test. And it counts these and compares how many test cases are missing a build against how many test cases we're expecting to get, sorry, how many test cases are missing a result for a build versus how many test cases there are in total from all of the previous builds that we've seen. And we can edit this in line within this document. So all of this is easily modifiable when you're running in this interactive mode. Uh, so a lot of noise here is being produced by x86 because at the moment it's fantastically unreliable. We can see that some test results are being grouped together because they have the same test result sequence and Currently, they also have the same test suite, but a different test name. So the test name has been omitted there because if we look up here, we can see we're allowing any test 
the grouping where tests have the same test suite and implicitly the same test sequence. We can remove this or change this to something else as well. OK, so what it might be useful to do here is simply remove x86. There we go. So now that we've uh, removed x86, we now have some slightly more interesting stuff. We can see here that Crash 02 has mysteriously started failing on PowerPC. It's not tagged with any bug, which would be here in the comments. I'll come back to bug tagging in a minute. Yeah, we can see Crash 02 has just started failing. Probably because the machine ran out of RAM rather than being an actual real bug. And of course, I just clicked on that. So you can click on all of these test statuses and it'll take you at least to the correct job. Um, you can also be happy here that stuff started passing. So this is slightly more useful. And down here we have some results. We can display results for test suites that are not in the LTP test, uh, and not in the LTP test suite. So everything else, basically. This is the public version of the report. In the other version, we have loads of different things, but we only run LTP and OpenSUSE at the moment. Oh, and Trinity, of course. We run Trinity, and of course, Trinity is a fuzzer, a system called fuzzer. So sometimes. It fails, usually because Trinity crashes, or um, it crashes the kernel on occasion. So we naturally expect to see Trinity in here quite a lot with different test results. OK, so hopefully that sheds some light on uh, the test matrix. Something else this report can do is once we've created this test matrix, it can inspect the matrix, find out which um, test cases have changed status, and then it can also check whether we've notified users recently that the test has changed status. And if we haven't, we can send them a notice using this standardized interface. Um, so this will message certain people um, depending on whether they've signed up for notifications for this for whatever test suite has changed status and also whether uh, they've provided some details on how to contact them. Uh, currently we mainly use Rocket Chat. There's also an email plugin as well. So this will basically just find a way of notifying somebody, um, presently just through Rocket Chat. OK. So then let's look at a different report. So let's look at the uh, bug tag propagation report. So first of all, I'll explain what bug tagging is. If we go back here again. Look in here. Oh, there's no bug tags yet. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why we needed the data cache is because OpenQA can be slow, as you see there. So we can see that in this uh, test, boot LTP is failing, which is a native OpenQA test. And we've tagged this failure. So a bug tag looks like this. We have the test name, and then we have a reference to um, some bug tracker. In this case, it's actually uh, progress.opensuzy.org, which is a red, which is red mine. And also, uh, when JDP, this is a propagated tag, so this is not the original tag. And when JDP propagates a tag, it uh, 
includes a summary of what, what the bug is. Um, and you can use any, you know, there's a whole variety of bug trackers which it will accept and which it will query and provide this summary for. Uh, OpenQA also understands bug tags to a limited extent. What it doesn't understand is that boot LTP is a test case in the LTP uh, test suite, which is embedded within OpenQA. And what it can't do is propagate these bug tags between OpenQA instances, and it can't, it obviously can't propagate them to other test frameworks. So with JDP, we have separation of responsibilities, and we're saying it's no longer OpenQA's responsibility to propagate bug tags so that we can have a propagation algorithm that can be used on multiple different uh, testing frameworks. And also say with a uh, test results database. So if we had an external test results database, we could instead propagate these um, tags to that database. Okay, so going back. Yes, and this is the script which performs the propagations. I've already fetched the results, so I won't do that again. But here we have a function which automatically figures out what the most recent uh, builds were for products which match some product pattern. This script is currently set up to uh, propagate tags just on the public instance of OpenQA. So it just finds um, Tumbleweed, which is the only thing we have configured at the moment for use with JDP. And we can run this and see if we have any untagged tests. Oh yes, we have a lot of untagged tests. Unsurprisingly, boot LTP. So again, we can click here. Yeah, we can see there's no comments for this. So these are the currently untagged um, tests on the most recent build, or the most recent build that's in our data cache. Then we have a chunk of code which finds um, existing bug tag references. Oh, we found 12 existing references. Let me have something that just displays these in a different way. Yeah, so it turns out that all of these boot LTP tests, which are untagged, we previously saw a tag for those. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect those um, well, what we're doing here is we're actually fetching from our cache the bug information. So here we just have an object which represents the reference to the bug tag, um, or represents the bug tag itself. And here we have the actual bugs which we fetched from whatever uh, tracker these bugs are tracked on. In this case, it's poo. Uh, poo is progress open org, which is redmine but it could also be uh, a different tracker like bugzilla or jira or um, whatever you like using <laughs> um, and then we have a function which just displays what we found so this is not necessary for bug tag propagation this just allows us to see what the bug tag propagation script found uh, so yeah, it's just saying, I'm just going to tag all of these with this bug. Then we have some stuff here for when we're running the script interactively like this. And then we actually have the dangerous part, which posts back to OpenQA. Um, we don't actually store bug tags on a permanent basis in JDP. JDP is not a source of truth, which I'll come to later. So we have to record the fact we've propagated these somewhere else. And then we have notifications to tell people that we've, uh, first of all, propagated some stuff 
and also to tell them that there's untagged bugs still. So they should do something about that. Of course, people ignore that. I mean, why would you do something about that? Okay, and then we finally have uh, a bit of code which just um, updates the the comments for the tags which were just properly uh, updates the comments on the jobs where bug tags were just propagated. So usually this would be somewhere else, but because we know we've just modified those things, we're going to just refetch those from the tracker to ensure that it's fully up to date when the next uh, report runs. OK, so it'd be quite unusual for anyone to actually run this script interactively. You'd usually just do that during development. So when I'm developing an update to this propagation algorithm, which is almost constant because there's always something new to do with bug tagging, which uh, makes this algorithm redundant. You know, it's a constant battle to, to make sure that things get propagated correctly. Um, I'd run it like this interactively and I can quickly iterate by uh, uh, get, grabbing all the results from our cache, um, creating some new algorithm to perform the propagations and then seeing what the results of those propagations would be all without doing anything to OpenQA and also using the real data from OpenQA. Um, okay, so we would usually run this report as part of a GitLab pipeline. Uh, this is the public pipeline. There's an internal one, which is vastly more complex. And this one just runs the um, bug tag propagation. Oh, dear me, Docker. Yes, this just runs the bug tag propagation as well as the uh, status diff report and a milestone report, which it doesn't need to run. And then it outputs those static reports along with the generated documentation, which is just here, which is linked to on the uh, GitLab repository. And it automatically includes these reports within the documentation. So if I click on this, we get to see a statically generated version of the report, which looks different to Jupyter. Uh, it's generated with the Weave library in Julia. And, ooh. That, <laughs> that is the wrong report. Anyway, so yeah, so this is, um, uploaded there. Right. So one last thing. Um, it's not necessary to write reports in Jupyter. Obviously, you can just uh, create a normal Julia script and write out to uh, standard out or do whatever you want. Or you can create a script which isn't a report at all. It's just some other workflow. Um, it's just more useful to show you a, a Jupyter report. OK, so before I start rambling too much, unless I've already started rambling too much, I'll go back to the presentation. So why create this? Well, because we hate spending time reviewing test results, especially when the review consists of finding out whether we previously uh, created a bug report for some failing test or created some backlog item to fix the test. And the bug taggings failed or some other problem has occurred or it was or it's been failing for a long time and it's basically on a an ignore list which isn't written down anywhere it just it makes it far easier for us to investigate 
what is happening with a failing test when we can easily see the entire history of that test, uh, what's happened with it previously. You know, there's a lot of cases where we, you know, at least in theory, we can completely automate the, the review. The review process from a human standpoint only becomes really important when a test starts failing that hasn't tested before, that hasn't failed before. And, you know, some kind of intelligent um, analysis of that failing test is required. Even cases such as a new test is added to the LTP, which um, is for a regression in the upstream kernel, and that regression, uh, the, the patch from the upstream kernel simply hasn't been uh, backported yet or never will be backported. At least in theory, we can get all that information from somewhere and automatically tag that test as uninteresting. And we can also do the inverse where we look for test failing test cases which are being ignored by people and look for evidence that actually they shouldn't be ignoring them. Again, when you have 20,000 test cases and you have test cases which randomly fail once in a thousand times and all this kind of stuff, it becomes very important to have a high level of automation. Uh, another good motivator is that a lot of the services we use, like OpenQA, Bugzilla, and so on, pretty much everything, they're all extremely slow, or their APIs are very slow. So what you end up doing is scraping data from them and then keeping a local data cache. So JDP just does that for you. Um, we also don't want to overload OpenQA with too many requests. Uh, so allowing JDP to take that load for it is is a good thing. Yeah, and you know, same stuff I said before. The architecture. So at the center, we have a master node, which fetches the data from various trackers um, and puts it into the data cache. And then we have uh, client nodes which replicate from the master cache. And those client nodes can be uh, something running in the cloud which runs reports and creates static reports, whatever. Or it can be an end user who's installed JDP on their local machine and is doing development or is just playing around with some of the reports. Um, and this is quite useful if you have teams distributed throughout the world but your trackers like OpenQA are running in-house somewhere and are not distributed in that way. So people can quickly get test results from OpenQA without actually having to wait while the OpenQA returns a, a result over a long distance. And yeah, we have this concept of um, trackers, which are basically plugins or data sources. Um, it handles reading the data as well as sending the data in some cases. OK. Yep, as I mentioned before, we load all the memory into data. This is for a number of reasons. One is that I don't really know what data structures and what algorithms people want to use. I do know that I will probably at some point want to use exotic data structures uh, like a graph, but I don't want to choose a graph database and use a graph, graph query language. Um, I know at some point I'll probably want to do something like an SQL query, but I don't want to use SQL because it then puts restrictions on, say, if you want to use stuff as a graph or whatever. Um, of course, there's nothing stopping us from using an SQL database in the back end, but it so happens that uh, Redis is much simpler. So we just load all the data into memory and allow the user to do whatever they want. Um, it does have some speed benefits as well for certain types of analysis, but you know, it's mainly a freedom thing. 
and um, yeah, the whole system is designed around that, so you can always be guaranteed you'll be able to easily load all your stuff into data. Yeah, if you want to do some sort of real-time stuff with it, then things get more complicated. But for you know, performing offline processing, it's it's very good. Yep, distributed data caches I just mentioned, and it's not a source of truth, so that we can delete everything without too much worry. We do store some temporary data within JDP, but not anything more permanent and crucial. I mean, you could store test results in it, but you just have to be aware that those test results may just disappear one day. And this allows us a lot of flexibility with JDP itself and how we proceed with development. Um, it's aimed at being easy for experts uh, in you know when you're running a report interactively uh, the reason being that if you want something that's very easy for non-experts in which in this case just meaning people that aren't programmers then this restricts your freedom and what you can do a lot and you end up spending a lot of time uh, creating dashboards uh, creating interfaces with drop-down boxes so people can create queries without learning how to use a query language. All of that stuff, that belongs in a different project as far as JDP is concerned. You can certainly use JDP in a project which aims to do that, but we're just not doing that. And that's also, at least in theory, one of my theories um, is that by doing that it will make it easier for experts versus if they have to delve into the back end of some dashboard based application so if you want to change the way that open qa's bug tag propagation works you need to dive into the back end of open qa set up quite a lot of stuff to to actually change anything and then you need to run it on a live database and revert the database if things go wrong learn a lot about how openqa works now data flows through it at least in theory with jdp that should be easier because everything is in a mostly self-contained report the only stuff outside of the report that's in the jdp backend should be stuff that's fairly generic that you will only rarely have to touch of course, that's in theory. In practice, right now, we're just out of the proof of concept stage, so I don't guarantee any of that to be true. And there's a lot more written about this in the documentation. OK, so this is a little bit out of date now. And basically, I have a huge amount of stuff on the backlog. So much stuff, I never know how I'm going to do it all. And there's loads of cool things I can think of to do with Julia. At Sorry, not Julia. I mean, also true for Julia, but for JDP. But choosing which ones to do is difficult. Um, there's so much to do and so many other things to do that it's very difficult to sort through those. So if you're in any way interested in this project, please let me know and what you'd like to use it for. And that can help me decide where to go next. Um, but one thing that I think is important to work out is that with the tools that JDP and Julia make available, we're really only scratching the surface here of, of what we can do. Our, if we take the bug tag propagation algorithm again, for example, it's using very simple methods to achieve what it does. Um, there's a lot of libraries and other frameworks that we can use to process our test result tags, and then intelligently decide what new test cases to tag, what test cases to highlight um, as interesting, uh, what you know, can provide recommendations for bug tags, recommendations for tests for users to go and look at. And there's a whole uh, large um, struggling to find the word here 
yeah, you get the picture. There's a lot of libraries out there that can do all that stuff. Oh yes, um, something else that's quite important is to make this, is to allow you to write reports in Python and R. But again, this is, this depends on whether people ask for it. But then you also get all of the um, libraries from Python, which again in this area is quite important. And Julia integrates very well with Python. So if you're put off by this purely on the basis of Julia, then there's always Python or R as well. And yeah, the, the project at the moment is quite messy. It's For now, it's mainly a one-man show. So it's mainly written by me. Uh, I've had a lot of input from my team members. Uh, Metern in particular has a lot of good ideas. But yeah, it's mainly a one-man show. So you have to bear that in mind as well when you're judging this. <laughs> ah, I mean, you can still judge it, I don't mind. I'm happy to receive feedback. It's better than silence. So if you need to get in contact with me, uh, some internal stuff there, but or you can just email me or contact me on uh, GitHub or GitLab, whatever. And that is the end. Hopefully I haven't rambled too much and some of that makes sense.